All is well here at Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, right. this is History Lens. Right. And if it's History Lens, what do you think? John David Ann is here. Professor John David Ann in History. Yes, HPU. Jay. Thank you for yeah, joining good us to see yet you, again. Jay. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So we talk about populism today. Populism is very important right, in right. understanding the evolution of, a, yeah. of American society. Yeah. But I want to I want to pose a, a, an issue to you first okay. before we get into the populism of the 1890s or the 1930s. <clears throat> you know the problem with history people? Ah. They tend to put labels on things. Uh oh. When in fact, if you look at the populism of 1896 versus the populism of 1930, ah. it wasn't the same. Right. And yet we all insist on putting labels on things right, like that. Right, right. And in fact, we don't even really call the 1930s an era of populism, although there are populists there. Um, it's, the thing is, as a movement in the 1930s, of course, it's not near, populism is not nearly as successful as it was in the 1890s, when in the South it took over you know, several legislatures and you had presidential candidates running. And in the 1930s, probably the best hope for... Uh, populism is Huey Long, and Huey Long, you know, is uh, he gets Ugly. it. He gets he. Uh, uh, he was he, assassinated. Yeah, he was assassinated, so he gets shot. And uh, so, if Huey had lived, you might have seen a more robust populist movement. Um, but we'll we'll come back and we'll talk about that. Okay. Well, here, so let's look at the 1890s yeah. for a moment. Yeah. So the Civil War is what 30 years old uh, or so. Yeah. Um, there, you know, we have Reconstruction, we have all kinds of unrest about that, about That's sort of re, re, reorganizing the South, right, in fact, reorganizing right. the country. And at the same time, we're doing Manifest Destiny yeah. out to the West and picking up states and territories yeah. left and right. Yeah. Um, and we have lots of action in Europe where things are consolidating in Italy and Germany. Right, uh, there's right. lots of action, lots of things going on. It's the, right. it's right. the, the run up to World War I, a lot of yeah. militarism and all yeah. that. Yeah. And in this country, Populism. Right. And why populism? Right. Populism assumes that there was something wrong with the right. status quo. Yeah, right. Yeah, and there was something. I mean, there was lots of things wrong. Uh, but two main things, of course, the rise of industrialism, the second industrial revolution in the United States created tremendous wealth. Uh, the and, robber barons. Yes, and, and huge enterprises with hundreds of thousands of employees. But, Railroads. But these great armies of workers were really they were poorly paid uh pullman they, city pullman city right although pullman was this is the weird thing about the pullman strike and uh, it, this, so this is let's go to that first shall we okay because okay, that's, that's right, right in the middle of this <laughs> right. populist uprising what happens in 1893 is the economy goes into the tank okay and so you've got You've got these big, huge enterprises that employ all of these people. And in, in Chicago, you have a company called the, the George Pullman Company, which makes Pullman cars for, on railroads, right? These are sleeping cars and sitting cars and the rest. And, and Pullman has been so successful, and Pullman was kind of a socialist. He believed in the collective. And so, I mean, he was a capitalist. He owned this very profitable company. But what he did is he built a town around his factory and it became it was actually incorporated as pullman illinois mm -hmm. and so and and he built housing for his workers he built uh, grocery stores libraries uh, lecture halls uh, and and visionary his, he was in some ways yeah i mean this kind mm -hmm. of uh, capitalist corporatism that pullman represented was he believed in it. He thought this would solve the problems of the division between capital and labor. Uh, and his, his employees had to pay a little bit for housing, you know, and they, of course, they had to pay for their groceries. But, but it was a kind of corporate welfare system that Pullman created. So, but it, but it, it had a flaw. Well, he charged them too much. Well, and they were, they he, were, he, they were he, serfs when he, it was he, all over. He didn't charge them too much until his enterprise went bust. Ah, so in 1893, okay. you have uh, a financial panic followed by a very serious depression. With, Who is uh, the president? Uh, this is uh, Grover Cleveland is the president. And, uh, you know, he's trying to solve the problem of the depression of 1893. But there it is in 1894. So s spring 1894, Pullman is in big trouble because almost all of his contracts with the railroads have been canceled. He doesn't have any uh, any contracts to build Pullmans, and so the 
So what's he going to do with all of these workers? Uh, and so, so first of all, he raises the rent, exactly as you said. He raises the rent quite a lot in the, the housing that his workers are Survivalist staying in. Survivalist first. And, yeah, and, so, uh, and they become unhappy about this. And then he has to begin to lay people off. And these people, they don't have anywhere to go because their housing was provided by Pullman. So, um, and so they, they're organized. They have a union. And uh, they get really angry. And in June 19, uh, pardon me, 1894, there's a confrontation between striking. So they go out on strike is essentially what happens. And, and there's this confrontation between striking Pullman workers and the governor of Illinois has called in the National Guard. Oh and goodness. there's a, in, in the streets of Pullman, there's a face off between these workers and, and the National Guard. Violence. And mayhem results. Uh, six workers are killed. Uh, Pullman, the city of Pullman is basically pulverized by, you know, by fires and by, I mean, there's so much that's destroyed there. So, um, and, and 1894 is a summer of strikes and, and very deep distress among uh, working folk. And so, so this was, this was the, the intersection of big capital, of robber barons, and of people who were being abused at That's the other right. end of that big capital. That's capitalism. exactly right. And yes. it had to get resolved somehow. Yes, well, so in the case of the Pullman strike, I mean, the National Guard eventually prevails in this. Actually, there's a gun battle that accompanies this standoff, and, and the, the workers have to back down, and they disappear from Pullman. They, I think many of them go into Chicago, and they're just wandering the streets. They're unemployed, and they're, you know, they're impoverished now. So... So that doesn't end very well, uh, but, but of course, you know, capital, capitalism with the force of arms behind it. And this is very typical of the populist period in the 1890s, is that capitalists put the force of firearms behind them in, to try to achieve their goals. Pinkerton goals. comes to mind. That's right. The, the other major event of the uh, labor event of the 1890s is in, is in 1892, I believe it is. So... So you have Carnegie Steel, right? Carnegie. This is in Pennsylvania. This is in this is in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Carnegie buys a plant from another company in Homestead, Pennsylvania, right on the Monongahela River, and uh, the the plant is it's you know it needs to be refitted and everything, and so and uh, so he's going to have to cut the wages of the workers who are there who become become Carnegie employees. He. He wants to cut the wages, and, and there's a union there that pre-exists, and he wants to get rid of the union. So, so he, do, he tries to do this in the summer of 1892. And this is before the National Labor Relations Act. That's correct. So That's, you, could, you could do terrible things exactly, to a union. Exactly. There's no inherent right to organize and to collectively bargain with your employer. So that's... That's what happens later. So, so uh, uh, Carnegie sails to Europe. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the, the mayhem that's going to result. Oh, boy. And he knew. He, 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 he leaves his second-in-command, Henry Frick, who is a steel-handed, hard man who... The Frick Museum in New York. That's, that's, that's got to be the family, that's, that's, huh? That's the same, yeah. It's, it's, it's the Frick family. Mama they, Baron. They, they, yes, use some of their money in a good way. Okay. But so, so Frick hires the Pinkertons. So what happens is the workers... They refuse to get rid of the union. They refuse the pay cuts, and they sh they lock the doors of the plant, and they they stay just sit in. And so you have wives bringing food, you know, handing food in over uh -huh. over the window and everything. And they're armed. They have weapons inside. So Frick hires the Pinkerton agency to take care of this. And the Pinkertons, these are detectives, but they're also really kind of mercenaries for hire. They're, uh, they're thugs. They're, they're kind of, yeah, they're capitalist thugs, really, in this case. So the Pinkertons hire a raft, uh, and they sail a raft down the Monongahela River. They're going to attack from the back. Oh, my God. Well, the Union <laughs> folks, they find out about this beforehand. I don't know how, but they did. They set up a line of defense using some of the big pieces of machinery that are sitting in the backyard. And, and so they're, they've got their weapons. Yeah, they've, they've got their weapons aimed, it's at more. The, aimed at the Pinkertons. They've got a small cannon that they actually it's fire more. at the Pinkertons on the raft. The, so they're firing at the Pinkertons. Now, the Pinkertons are not prepared for this. So the Pinkertons have to land the raft, and they have to put their hands up and give up. 
And so the, this squad of Pinkertons has to run through uh, two lines of these union members who are bopping them on the head as they run through the lines. Wow. <laughs> Let's hear it for the union. <laughs> it was short-lived. So what happens then is the governor of Pennsylvania calls out the National Guard. The National Guard takes over the plant. Uh, the union members, the workers, are, you know, they're expelled from the plant, and they, have, they also have to wander somewhere and to find no you know, employment somewhere else yeah. because obviously they're, go they're going to be unemployed. So see, that's one leg of the populist revolt. And then, of course, the other leg is the leg that we talked about last time, and that's the farmer revolt. Yes. Where the farmers were getting a bad deal from elevators, from bankers, from railroads, and then in the south from the big plantation owners where they were sharecroppers and not, not being able to keep a decent share of their These crop. are major instabilities in the country. They, they are. You know, it's, it's, it's a time period of, of huge amounts of wealth being created and then huge amounts of disturbance and unease, unrest in the country. Yeah. Um, and I suppose in some ways it, it culminates in the election of 1896 with William Jennings Bryan. Now, we left off with William Jennings Bryan last time. Yeah. We were talking about Bryan, and, and um, Bryan, of course, uh, he's a lawyer. He becomes senator from Nebraska, uh, a tremendous orator, uh, and a guy who is a populist himself. I mean, he's from a farming state. He understands the, the plight of farmers. He runs for president in 18, he had run for president in 1892, actually, unsuccessfully, but runs again in 1896, and to the surprise of the Democratic Party, he actually wins the nomination. And so at this point, what happens is the, the populists have organized themselves into a political party called the People's Party. Okay? These are the farmers from the, the western part of the country and the southern part of the country. And so the, the populists in 1892, they run their own presidential candidate. In 1896, they decide, you know, if we're really going to have an impact, we should fuse with the Democratic Party and, and support William Jennings Bryan, because Bryan is, is a friend of the farmer. Okay, so, the, so that's what happens. The populists actually fuse with the Democratic Party, and they support Bryan. Um, but the problem is that Bryan gets fixated on one issue. And the issue is, it's the, the silver issue. And the, so this, this gets a little complicated. So, so in eight, in the, from the 1870s to the 1890s, uh, the United States was mostly on the gold standard. Okay. And this meant that there was relatively scarce amount of currency, the metal currency that was used for transactions, gold. Uh, not and that much of it. Not that much of it because it's fairly scarce. It, there's not, there weren't that many gold mines in the United States at that point, and so you couldn't produce that much, and there was not that much minted. That meant that money was relatively scarce, and that also meant that interest rates were high because money was dear. Because right, yeah. it would, you know, it was the value of gold was greater than the value assigned to it as a currency. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you have high interest rates, and this affects farmers a lot because farmers are always borrowing money. You have to have, you know, farmers don't start with any capital, so they have to have money in order to make their, you know, their 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 enterprise work properly. So, so the farmers don't like this, and they're lobbying for something called the silver standard or what's sometimes called a bimetallic standard, where you still have gold in circulation, but that would be accompanied by some silver in circulation. Now, in the late 19th century, there are many silver mines in the West, some in Colorado, some elsewhere in the West, that are opened up and that are producing quite a lot of silver. And, and the farmers want at least some of this silver to be minted and put into circulation. That would reduce interest rates now, the concern of economists is that it would also probably cause more inflation, which was a huge concern There's more for of it. Yeah. So this huge concern for, uh, for uh, pe people who, for instance, uh, employees who, who are on a fixed income, right? If, you, if, if the goods that you need to buy to stay alive cost more, then, then you're, you're essentially you're being paid less, right? So... So, so Eastern uh, entrepreneurs, the, the, the robber barons, the titans of industry did not like this, the silver standard idea at all. It's the farmers of the West that like it. Brian latches on to this, 
and he becomes so enamored on of, the silver side on, of, it. of of you know, the bimetallic standard, yes, mm -hmm. that he gives a speech in accepting his nomination, in which he ends the speech by putting out his hands and saying, "Do not crucify me on a cross of gold." And he's actually referring to the gold standard. It's a, that, it's a, and that's pretty sophisticated. <laughs> and maybe that, that well, he should have been on other issues as well. Eh? Yeah. Well, this was this was one of the problems with the populists is that they latched onto a guy who was a single issue. And the populist movement was very broad based. Uh, they they were trying to attack a lot of inequities in in that time period. When you look at the the party platform, for instance, it's good. they got eight, ten issues that are important to them, and the silver standard is just one of them. So but then they merged. So they merged, and Brian, he, he, he travels yes. the entire country. He gives 270 speeches. It's, I mean, he is going, 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 and his opponent, William McKinley, sits at his house and comes out onto the front porch and occasionally gives a speech. To the press. Yes, and, and his surrogates go around the country, and, and uh, uh, this is actually, this is one of the last times you have what's called a front porch campaign. It's McKinley does this. Because McKinley knows that if the economy improves as it does in 1896, that he really won't have to do much of anything because the problem is Brian has really frightened the entrenched interests in the country. Uh, not just employers, but those who are employed, the great army of workers, uh, they get nervous about this idea of, of a silver standard that might raise the cost of food and other you know, important items to them. So, How does this all connect with um, the Spanish-American War, which happened only a year later? Well, it's, it, so, so for one thing, McKinley wins. Uh, the conservative forces win. Brian loses quite badly. And, and the it, populists are gone. It, it, well, they're as not a, gone. As an identifiable party. It, no, they, they, stay for, they stay around in, in, in particular fragmented. states. Yeah. For, yeah, it's fragmented. They, they never again have a national platform and a national campaign and a national candidate like they did in 1896. And, and how does the, so, the, 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 so, the bimetallic standard, so, how does that work out? Well, it's never, it's never implemented. So what in fact happens is that in the 1890s, there is some sil silver in circulation. And Grover Cleveland, the Democratic president, who's a moderate, not a populist, actually begins to withdraw some of that uh, silver currency because he believes that, it's, that it helped to cause the, the depression of the 1890s. Now, I'm not certain that's true, but he did withdraw uh, the silver Economics that was, was a young science at it, the time. It was, yeah, people didn't really, you know, e the economists were kind of scary creatures back then. Uh, <laughs> you mean they're not scary now? <laughs> well, well, no, they're just boring <laughs> now. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so okay, the, the so dismal it, science. Of, so 1896 of then right, is right. the, that's the critical thing with William that's Jennings That's the Bryan. year that could have been transformative for the country, but turns out to not. The, so it the, sounds like when you say populist in yeah, that context, yeah. you're really defining populist by how it emerged, by, by who was involved, by what their positions were, yeah. rather than any particular mm, well, you know, no, I mean, concept. The, no, I mean, the, the, the issues, of course, were populist issues. You know, issues to, uh, you know, it's to, it's to an eight dollar, pardon me, an eight hour workday. Uh, raise, it's a working man's party. Yeah, raise the wages of workers. Um, uh, make sure that political corruption is ended, right? Because the populists were not just concerned about economic issues, they were concerned about democracy. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, though. right. Those are, those are good things. And then, of course, the, the farmer populace had a, had a whole set of, uh, their part of the platform was concerned with uh, instituting what they called uh, uh, federal treasury warehouses. Uh, that where you could actually bring your grain, keep your grain away from the privately run elevators who would, who would uh, manipulate your grain scoring, your grain grading, and uh, put the grain in these, these sub-treasury warehouses in which then you could borrow money against that from the federal government, uh, your grain would be protected, then you could sell the grain. When in that sell. regard, it sounds like if you call the farmers populace, this was really the Farmers Party. This was to protect the interests of the farmers, well, the it, smaller farmers. Yeah, I mean, the People's Party was broader than that. Yeah. But what was behind the People's Party was mainly uh, farmers. 
Wow. It was mainly farmers. Okay. So, so fast forward, yeah. we're yeah. fragmented right. uh, after the uh, what, 1896 so, election. So, yeah. And, and, and that's that, right. Now, now, you mentioned that but, 1930. But hang on a second. You okay. asked about the Spanish American War. Yes. So, just very quickly. So, what happens is the forces of conservatism and, and really kind of this kind of big, big power capitalism prevail in 1896. And in 1898, then, they go forward with a war against Spain. And it's not just a war to increase global markets for capitalism, but that is one of the beneficiaries of the war with Spain, is the United States now becomes an empire. And in the Philippines and in Hawaii, you have places where you can stop for coaling, you have new markets you can sell stuff, stuff to. So, so John D. Rockefeller loves the fact that he can now sell kerosene, standard oil kerosene, in in the Philippines, so which is an American possession. We got, so we got global. So we, we started taking right, manifest right. destiny so, offshore. Yeah. So that's that's a just a very brief summary of it. But but that's true that it does uh, strengthen the hand, I think, of capitalists. Yeah. In the late 19th century. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By the way, was was there really a Maine? Oh yeah. There and was a was, was the Maine a Maine. provocation or, <laughs> or a real attack on the United States? <laughs> Well, we think what happened is that a... It's just like the Tonkin Gulf, you know? <laughs> no, no. Nothing really happened. We okay. think that what, what happened is the, the main used bituminous coal, which is a soft coal. Not, yeah, yeah, that's right, bituminous coal, and, uh, or lignite. It was one of those two. It was the softer coal. And this coal gives off a gas, unlike anthracite. This coal actually, as it sits there, it gives off Flammable. gases. Yeah that become flammable, and we think there was an explosion. It was spontaneous combustion from the coal bunk. So yeah. we say, remember the Maine. Right. <clears throat> it's okay, not was... because somebody attacked the Maine. <laughs> no. Well, that was the implication, though. Uh, <laughs> okay, and, and got that's it. What, that's what the, you know, uh, William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper, uh, you know, the newspaper owner, that was his phrase, remember the Maine, and that was because, I mean, he wanted the public, he wanted a war. Right, he wanted, he, Wars sometimes yeah. start with no reason at all. <laughs> okay, so fast forward. Yes, we don't have right. too much time. Fast forward to 1930 right. when right. populism emerges again, perhaps right. in a slightly different form. Yeah, well, so, of course, it's quite different. Well, it's not quite different. It's significant, significantly a more serious depression than the 1890s uh, depression. Um, the Great Depression, of course, is really serious. 25% unemployment, 50% drop in industrial production. I mean, this is a very serious business. And so what you have is for the first couple of years of the Depression, you have a do-nothing president in Hoover. And of course, he's, he has to exit. He loses the race to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who says, we're going to try everything. We're going to do everything to try to solve this crisis. And Roosevelt does lots of things in the first two years of his presidency. Uh, there, there's a picture of Franklin Roosevelt there before the microphones. And uh, so Roosevelt, you know, one of the things he says is, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. It's a great quote, actually, and I think it's quite true that we should remember that one. Uh, so, so Roosevelt is doing things. He implements uh, the beginnings of the New Deal. Lots of legislation is passed. Some of it's ruled unconstitutional. But by 1934, 35, you still got... Uh, millions of people unemployed. Unemployment is still at 20, 22 percent. Uh, and so, so what happens is people emerge uh, who had supported Roosevelt in 1933, 1932, 33, during the campaign in his early presidency. People begin to emerge who we will call populists. Uh, and they, they begin to oppose Roosevelt. They say, hey, you haven't done enough. People are starving in the streets. And in some cases, that's actually true. In Detroit in the, the winter of 1933, people did in fact starve in the streets. 70% unemployment, people were being evicted from their housing, a bitterly cold winter. So, so the, it was really serious. I mean, this wasn't just, uh, you know, demagogues making this up. But uh, so those who opposed Roosevelt in 1934-35, let's talk about those folks for a second. So we talked about Huey Long last time, right? So we don't need to say much about him. Except let's bring his picture up. There's Huey Long. And Huey became quite popular in this time period. As I said, he had a national campaign. He had this plan called the Share the Wealth Plan. He was going to help the small guy. He was going to help the small Unfortunately, guy. Unfortunately, he was a liar and a demagogue. <laughs> he was. He was a bit of a demagogue. But, but still, uh, he puts pressure on Roosevelt. 
Okay. So again, uh, kind of a conservative. Uh, Roosevelt's definitely conservative in many mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. uh, but puts pressure on Roosevelt. And then you have the emergence of Father Coughlin, another populist. And here's Father Coughlin. That's a great picture of him. That's later on in his life. But there he is. He's raising his fist. He's shouting. And okay, Father Coughlin is about the, the poor guy, the little people. But Father Coughlin is also anti-Semitic. Uh, he's anti-immigrant, and he's pretty racist. In fact, he gets in trouble with the Catholic Church in the late 1930s because he is, his rhetoric is just so distasteful. That's a very interesting connection. I, yeah. I don't think people realize that there were two sides. One is he's appealing, right. uh, as Huey Long did, to the little guy. And the other is he's a racist, yeah. and um, you know he's got all kinds of negative aspects. Yeah, yeah. no, that's true. So, and, uh, and this was true in the 1890s, too. Now, William Jennings Bryan was not a racist like that, but there were, among the populists, there were those. So there was a quite, shift in quite, the way you look at populism well, between there were, there were, first and second No, I wouldn't say. No, I mean, there were, there were those who were nativists and racists in the first populist movement, and they're, once again, they're here in the, in the 1930s. So, so Coughlin is a radio priest. He starts ah. doing radio shows in the late 1920s, and by the early 1930s, he's got a audience of millions in the United States. Sunday nights, many families devote their time to turn on the radio and listen to Father Coughlin give speeches. So he has got tremendous influence for a short time period, at least. He's probably more influential than, than Huey Long because he's got this, this radio uh, niche. So if we, had, if we had another show to continue yeah. this discussion, yeah. where would it go? Because we're almost out of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so... So uh, you have Father Coughlin, then you have a couple of other characters, but let's, let's leave it at Father Coughlin. So what you have is both Coughlin and Long and other, polit other politically minded people are pushing Roosevelt, pushing Roosevelt. Roosevelt is concerned. He believes he might, be, might lose the election in 1936, to, maybe to Huey Long. And so what he, Roosevelt does is in 1935, he embraces a leftward move. He embraces Social Security, and it flies through the, the Congress, which is dem controlled by Democrats. He embraces the WPA, which is an unemployment act, which it puts the... Helping the little guy. That's right. Put this, the unemployed to work. And he embraces the Wagner Act, which is what we referred to earlier. This protecting is the, the nat rights of unions. National Labor Relations yeah. Act, which is going to protect unions and organizing. And so he does that deliberately to really uh, nullify. He pulls the rug out from under the populace. He does, but in doing so, he moves to the left. He becomes more leftist himself, and he sets in place what we know today as the base of the New Deal. Fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. So, and we so have he, to, we have, we're out of time, but <laughs> we have to understand no, this no, stuff. Wait, no, no, <laughs> We have to come back and finish the story, okay, John. Okay. No, it's, There's it's more fine. in all of history. There's a story. <laughs> you can quote me on that. <laughs> John David, an HBU professor. Thank you very much, John. Good to be here, Jay. <laughs> Aloha.